I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. This video, I'm continuing my analysis into my epistemology, uh, epistemological, into my epistemology lecture series. This is going to, first I didn't need to start my watch. This is going to represent um, section 1.2 of the analysis. As you guys know, just click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF. Download the PDF and use it to supplement your readings. Again, um, readings are extremely complicated, especially if this is the first time that you've ever read um, philosophical text. It can be overwhelming what the author means. The idea behind um, all of the time and effort that I put into reading and creating the lectures and videotaping and recording and shooting and blah, 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 is to facilitate an understanding so that you can better come to grasp the concepts, the most difficult bits of any academic endeavor is understanding what's really being said, especially at a very advanced level. If you can read having watched these videos and make more sense of what you're reading, you'll become a better, better by default, you'll become a better critical thinker because now you have an understanding of the way in which the authors use the language that they use. And philosophy is a very, very unique type of language. Academic philosophical writing is a very nuanced, very specific, niche-specific type of writing. Um, and for, you know, younger students not, not accustomed to the, the tradition, the canon, it can be a bit laborious to go through academic philosophical texts and make sense of it. So hopefully this, this lecture series will make epistemology um, more accessible to the masses, right? Um, well, not the masses, let's keep it funky. <laughs> make it more accessible to more people. Let's put it like that, right? It'll just make it more accessible. All right, so um, again, the, the book that I'm using is uh, the Blackwell Philosophies Anthology Superb um, Intro Level. It's actually, you can take it, you can use the same book at an advanced level, but I'm using it for an introduction to epistemology. So superb for uh, an introduction to epistemology. This is the Sosa Kim uh, edited volume. So get 15 copies of that uh, and let's begin. So this is section 1.2 and we're going to continue with, uh, I forget the name of the article, Barry Stroud's uh, um, The Problem of the External World. So the problem of the external world in that edited volume, pages 6 through 23. So this is an introduction to epistemology. And this is section 1.2. Okay. In the last section, what we discussed was the difficulty in making... Uh, making use of the individual beliefs that we have uh, in, in an attempt to assess the sum total of our content knowledge. Right? It doesn't make sense to look at individual beliefs in order to assess the sum total of our epistemological knowledge because of at least two reasons. One, individual beliefs are themselves open to, assuming that you're not dogmatic, are open to transformation. You can believe something to be true at one time, and then you can realize that that belief is no longer true, and it, and it oscillates. It can go back and forth. It very rarely does, but it could. Which means that when we consider the sum total of all the beliefs, there's a lot of change in the content of our belief, so that it's morphing holistically that's very difficult to keep track of. Very difficult to keep track of. The next thing is that in a meta-analysis of an individual belief, we, re we recognize that the meta-analysis of the belief leads to the belief of the belief, which leads to the belief of the belief of the belief, and thus um, the meta-analysis of any individual belief lends itself to uh, an infinite regress, which cripples the very thing that we're attempting to do. Coupled by the third part, which is a consolidation of, or the, the, the overlap of both sort of the transformational aspects of individual beliefs coupled with a meta-analysis of belief, my belief of my belief, leads to an infinite transformational capacity of one individual belief, right? So it's actually threefold um, difficulty. So, I mean, rather technical stuff, but we ended the last section 
by saying what we're going to do is we're going to, at, this, at least at this level, entertain a more Cartesian. Anytime you say the word Cartesian in philosophy, it has like a pejorative tone to it. I don't know why. Just my education, I guess. But it, it's not meant to have a pejorative tone, right? I mean, a negative tone. The idea then is what we're going to do is consolidate beliefs um, into more rudimentary, more foundational, um, more generalized notions, concepts. All of this is conceptual. More generalized concepts. These generalized concepts will consolidate individual beliefs, so it'll make more sense to talk about principles, which is the term that will apply, the Cartesian term that will apply to the consolidated beliefs. It makes more sense to talk about principles than it does beliefs. Thus, we recognize that in the epistemological assessment of an, the contents of an individual perceiver's holistic beliefs, there will be less principles than there are beliefs. Why? Because principles are the sense in which we've consolidated our beliefs. So, hopefully that's, that's obvious now. So what we're going to look at is the um, systematic analysis of large classes of beliefs. Now, I'm not going to write large classes of beliefs because it's just too much to write off of like writing. Large classes of beliefs, LCB. All right? So, large classes of belief. So, this is sort of the, 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 a more simplified approach. This is me. Rather than attempting to assess individual beliefs, we can identify the basis of our beliefs, right? the basis of our beliefs within these large classes. This is done by asking how. This is done by asking how are these beliefs related? What is the relationship between belief one as an individual belief and its relationship to belief two? This legitimizes the picture above. It's a pretty hokey picture, but it makes sense, right? The belief that I get a cold in all these different ways are all individual beliefs, but we can consolidate those beliefs by asking how are these beliefs related? All of these beliefs are related. You have to watch the previous section to make sense of what I just said. But um, all of these beliefs are related insofar as they all pertain to ways in which individuals catch colds. Right? And you can even be more specific and say falsified ways in which people believe one catches a cold. Right? You believe you catch a cold by taking a shower and not drying your hair. Believe you catch a cold by walking on cold tile without shoes on. You believe you catch a cold by walking in the rain without an umbrella and blah, 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 blah. All of those beliefs pertain to how, right? How do they relate? They relate the how, the how, addressing, answering how, how do these beliefs relate will lead us to a recognition that they all relate to the cold, ways in which we catch a cold, so that we can consolidate those individual beliefs into a much more foundational assessment, which is ways in which people catch colds, right? So then that consolidates a ton of stuff. Even things I don't know and I don't believe, if it's introduced into my content knowledge, I can immediately, quote unquote, sort it into ways in which people catch colds or falsified ways in which people catch colds. So I think the idea should be rather obvious here. Okay, so this is done by asking how these beliefs are related. That is, what connects these individual beliefs? What is the basis of the belief? So, I mean, I talked about that rather expensively last time. Number two, asking how, asking the question of how these beliefs are related is the means of assessing the nature of this connectivity. So we recognize then that we have sort of a means and how becomes our means, right, to the end. Right? And the question is, what, what is the nature of the end state? It seems that the nature of the end state is going to be um, obvious at this point. We'll recognize later that it's actually a little less obvious than you think. But it seems, at least at first glance, that the nature of the nature of the end is an attempt to understand how we think. Or it could be an attempt to understand how we organize the things that we think about. Or it could be an attempt to understand the connectivity and relationship between individual beliefs and the principles that inhere. Right? Okay, all of that's fine. The idea is not so much the end at this point, it's the recognition that we recognize that by addressing how these beliefs are related, it leads us to a more complex understanding. It leads us, right? By asking 